Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to March Mystery Madness. This is a venerable BookTube event, is it not, baby? <laughs> uh, about murder mysteries in all their various shapes and sizes. Uh, I love reading murder mysteries anyway. I'm extra invested this particular year because I am strongly considering writing a murder mystery for Camp NaNoWriMo, which starts in only two weeks. Uh, which would require me to understand murder mysteries. You can't wing it with a murder mystery. I don't think you can. They seem to be rather heavily dependent on the author knowing everything about the plot ahead of time. Otherwise, the earlier scenes don't work. Maybe that's the point of writing a first draft, and maybe that's all that NaNoWriMo was supposed to be, but it seems to me that I should know more about what the mechanics of how a murder mystery works before I launch off on writing one. I still have time. But... My love affair with murder mysteries this time around for March Mystery Madness has uh, has hit some bumps, mainly involving the police, mainly, mainly involving the involvement of the police in the murder mystery. Are they the ones solving the crime? Are they the ones making the solution possible for the so-called amateur detective? Are they adversarial to the whole process? Are they believable? How much am I complicit with them? when I read a story where they're the heroes, and how much do I want to be complicit with them. And that has led me, I read a few real policeman-oriented procedurals, a couple from the Golden Age, and that led me to sort of pull away, go go towards amateur detectives that don't have much to do with the police. Or, But even there, I was finding a degree of complicity. I was finding a degree where, sure, the amateur flits all about and doesn't have to obey police rules or whatnot, but eventually, they need information from the police or the strong arm of the law to make anything happen. And then I went more towards uh, uh, fluttering around there, okay, an ex-cop, maybe uh, a detective who is called in by the police to consult, so he doesn't have to approve of their, of their methods, or maybe it's a real small town so that their methods aren't bad. Uh, and... <laughs> I will still do that. I will be wrestling with that. Obviously, that will be the theme of my Marsh Mystery Madness this year. We'll be wrestling with the police, with that, those two vectors that I talked about, the vector of detection and authority. Are they separate? Are they the same? Do they cross at the climax of the book? What are, what, where, where are those vectors disposed of? I'm going to have to figure that out anyway for any murder mystery that I would write. But... I did still want to break, and, and after all, the informal theme of March Mystery Madness this time around is lather, rinse, repeat, which is me meant that I'm not, I'm trying not to read anything for the first time the, in March. I love finding new murder mysteries, I love reading things for the first time, but I think for, for this year of March Mystery Madness, I will just stick with things I've already read. And when I was looking at my relatively small murder mystery collection, I don't have more than 100 books here. Unless you count ebooks, in which case I have a lot more than that. <laughs> a lot more. But I was looking at print books. And uh, I, I was thinking that I needed a break. And I was thinking also that I needed something where the, the sleuth involved uh, isn't connected with the police. <laughs> isn't at all connected with the police. In fact, maybe even has an adversarial relationship with them. Now, that's gotten harder and harder to do in the 21st century. That's become almost impossible to do in a murder mystery, but uh, I found one. <laughs> I found one that I didn't have to look far, and I didn't need much nudging to reread this particular novel. <laughs> I found this. Rumpole and the Penge Bungalow Murders <laughs> by John Motormer, which had been foreshadowed in Rumpole's stories for decades. This is the story of the battered old Bailey hack, Horace Rumpel, who uh, reaps the rich pickings of the legal aid system in order to fight the good fight in number three, Equity Court. <laughs> and he never pleads guilty. He is always defending the downtrodden and the apparently hopelessly convicted. And he loves to tangle cops in their notebooks. He loves to catch them in complacent, flaccid lies. He loves to make fools of them on the stand. He is very much not complicit with the police. He has an investigator himself, Fig Newton, and he has a, he is a barrister in the courtroom, but he has a, a, a brief. He has a, what we would consider to be a lawyer who helps him and informs him in the case. And, and uh, that's all he needs. He doesn't need the police. 
he's interested in them only in the, to, to the extent of whether or not they are going to shed light on who is innocent and who is guilty. He certainly does not view them as the judge of who is innocent and who is guilty. Uh, and the reason why this novel had been foreshadowed by John Mortimer for decades is because in all of the Rumpel short stories that we get, that we got for years and years, we are constantly told the Rumpel that we meet in those short stories is, um, <laughs> he's older. He's, he's older. He's, one could say, uh oh, oh, it's Frida Yoga. Oh my God, are you going to come down here, baby? Huh. Oh no, all the way to the floor. Oh goodness, I hate it when she does that now because she's not a spring chicken anymore. She's six, and she doesn't like to jump back up. Uh, she, she, she happily jumps down, but then she can't jump back up again. Uh, but anyway, uh, we'll make this quick, and we'll we'll go. I will go and tend to the bean. <laughs> uh, in all of those stories where we have a battered old warhorse of a barrister, Rumpel is constantly reflecting on the fact that he that if you consult the relevant volume of notable British trials, you will find that when he was a young barrister, he won the case of the Penge Bungalow mysteries uh, murders alone and without a leader. I mean, there are two advocates. The senior one will do most of the talking. They will do most of the leading. And the junior one is to take a good note or to supply reference works or whatnot. And uh, Rumpel, it, finally, after years and years of alluding to this case, John Mortimer reached a point where he no longer really felt like writing Rumpel short stories. Instead, we got a row of Rumpel novels. Uh, that are really good. They are in a very interestingly different register from the short stories, and are quite enjoyable. There's there's six or seven of them that are that are uh, very different from uh, in in some ways very different from the rumple that we got in the short stories, and yet very very enjoyable. I think that if I had to identify the way that the novels are different, it's that they know about the short stories. Not in the sense of the content of the short stories, but that they know that Rumpel is famous. They know that this is that this is a, a beloved, well-known character. The novels know that. The short stories don't. Uh, it's be hard. I could pick it out if I had to analyze the prose, I, but it'd be pretty hard to describe it here. But after a few of those novels, R John Mortimer decided finally to just give us this case. So, so he gives us a young Horace Rumpel who has a whole bunch of people in his life that, whose names we know, but a whole bunch of people whose names we don't know. A whole bunch of characters in here that we see from way before we meet them in the short stories, including she who must be obeyed, Hilda, who will soon become his wife, and her father, C.H. Whiston, who is the head of Chambers, and a whole bunch of other characters uh, that, that are fixtures of the short stories. But this is in their earlier days, in the dawn of their acquaintance. And it, the story is about two RAF pilots who, uh, well, there's a murder. There's a double murder. And the son of one of those RAF pilots seems to be the foremost suspect. And he seems hopelessly intent on convicting himself out of his own mouth. A hapless boy, but not, we ever get the, 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 the impression, an evil one. And Rumble doesn't get that impression either. And he's not interested in a slam dunk case if it puts the innocent behind bars. That much is true all throughout the Rumpel stories, all throughout the, the Rumpel oeuvre. Uh, so he goes about investigating and and doing this trial alone and without a leader in front of a, an imperious and somewhat clueless judge. And uh, you can see already the narrative obstacles to such a thing as this, Right? I mean, the readers have been curious forever to know about the details of the Penge bungalow murders. Most readers, I'm sure, were like me and thought we would never get those details, any more than you get the details of the giant rat of Sumatra in, in, uh, in Sherlock Holmes. Uh, readers have been curious about these details, but readers also know everything about what's going to happen. It is not possible that Rumpel will lose this case, for instance, so we know already that, young, that the young boy is innocent. It's not possible that that any uh, that the flirtatious relationship we has with a woman named Daisy will ever come to anything, because we know that he will marry Hilda. <laughs> we know that she will make him marry her. She will leave him no choice. We know uh, when when it looks like his standing at number three Equity Court is in danger. We know that it isn't, because he's going to stay there for decades. Uh, Mortimer knows all that going in. That's a very heavy burden for a, a storyteller to assume. That. It, the, the element that you're giving up is any element of suspense. Anywhere, with any of the characters, there's no element of suspense, and yet the novel works. 
I think probably because, like I mentioned with the other novels, it's mostly relishing in the fact that Rumpel fans, at the time this, at one point Rumpel fans were legion, Rumpel has been off the air for a long time, Leo McKern, the great interpreter of the character, is long gone, Albert Finney, thank God, died before he could take Rumpel to the big screen. I, I, I don't know that, that uh, people under the age of 40 know this character or any of the parts connected with his, with his mythology. So maybe this wouldn't have that kind of resonance anymore. But I think the, the, the way that Mortimer gets around the problem of the fact that he has intentionally, he is intentionally telling a story that can't have any suspense is by just reveling in it. You, this is very much, I guess, fan service would be the, the noxious 21st century term for it. And I loved it. Loved every page of it. And I loved revisiting it. I loved rereading it. In this cute uh, Penguin paperback that my surly houseboy got me in the UK back in the days when, when uh, he could leave for any extended period of time. He went on a vacation in the UK and he got me this. Not because he likes it. Not because he's, he, he knows anything about Rumpel, but because he'd heard me talk about the character. <laughs> Uh, so I was I reread it in a penguin mass market with, 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 that looks like the old style penguins do. Just delightful. I wish I had all of these. I know that Penguin did a huge number of these, not in this country, but in the UK. And I would love to have them all, but God knows what they cost on eBay now. But this cured what ailed me. Absolutely. This this was Rumpel has no use for cops. He believes they're all lying. He believes they're all trying to put his clients behind bars unjustly. So that was perfect. That was exactly what I needed. Not only does he not have any direct connection with them, but he doesn't have any high regard for them either. And I don't mean to be anti-cop, but I needed that after some of the books that I've been reading. So now I consider the slate clean. So I'm not going to care. The next thing that I pick, the, the mystery that I pick for tonight, I'm not going to care the role that police play in it. Unless the books, unless I have another bad run and the books convince me to care, but otherwise, no. Otherwise, I'm, the scales are now balanced, thanks to Rumpel, <laughs> thanks, to, uh, thanks to the old Bailey hack. Uh, so that's it. That is March Mystery Madness for today. It is Rumpel and the Penge Bungalow Murders. I don't know that I'll reread it again for quite some time. I doubt I'll reread it next year. But it was a delight. It was exactly what I needed, as Rumpel short stories and novels tend to be. So uh, I'll wrap this up for now, and I'll be back. Thank you, Booktube.